Welcome everyone to this London Futurist webinar. My name is David Wood. In a moment, I'll introduce today's speaker, Professor Stefan Sorgner. First, let me say a few quick words about London Futurists. London Futurists take seriously the possibility that the comparatively near future might be significantly different from the present. One thing that changes society and the human experience is technology. Historically, the world was changed by new forms of weaponry. It's been changed by the invention of steam power, by electricity, by synthetic chemicals, by computers, by wireless communications. And there's a reasonable chance that in the decades ahead, there will be large changes from progress in, for example, synthetic biology, artificial intelligence, next generation green technology, quantum computers, and neurotechnology. But London Futurists are aware it's not just technology that changes the world. The world is also changed by ideas. Historically, the world was changed by the idea of the divine rights of kings, of the idea of salvation by faith, then by revolutionary notions of liberty, egality, and fraternity, by the ideas of humanism, enlightenment, and the class struggle, and more recently by ideas of such as sustainability, gender rights, valuing diversity, and support for minorities. And in the decades ahead, I believe we can expect large changes from more and more people coming to terms with the idea of transhumanism and related post-human notions. It's still early days in the public understanding of transhumanism, but one person who is blazing a trail of explanation about transhumanism, especially in continental Europe and in a number of key academic circles, is today's speaker, Stefan Lorenz Sorgner. Stefan is a professor of philosophy and chair of the Department of History and Humanities at John Cabot University in Rome. He is also director and co-founder of the Beyond Humanism Network, fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, research fellow at IHWA Institute for Humanities in Seoul, Korea, and visiting fellow at the Ethics Center of the Friedrich Schiller University in Jena in Germany. Stefan is the editor of more than 10 essay collections and author of six monographs. His forthcoming new book is We Have Always Been Cyborgs. Stefan, welcome to London Futurists and over to you. Many thanks, dear David, um, for the kind uh, presentation and kind introduction. I hope I'll also be able to join you in, in London again sometime because I, I used to live, I used to study in London, at King's College in London. That's where I got my first degree from um, in, in philosophy during the, in the middle of the 19th. And that was, it was just, I've all, whenever I return to London, it's just, I feel at home at that place. So greetings to London from, from Rome. Yes, today I'll be talking about, we have always been cyborgs and in particular about the usage of digital data and about the need to rethink the meaning of digital data. Smart watches, the internet of things, and a permanently increasing amount of autonomous cars are nowadays an integral part of our life world. It would be naive to assume that here was, these developments have come to an end. About six million years ago, the last common ancestor of human beings and crepes apes existed. The commercial use of the internet was established about 30 years ago. We need to acknowledge that the digital age is still its embryonic state, and it has already had significant effects upon our lifestyles all around the world. The digitalization process has also altered the potentials of other emerging technologies, among which the great variety of gene technologies is particularly noteworthy. The gene scissor, CRISPR-Cas9, or more general genome editing, might even be the most important scientific and technological invention of this decade. Yet without the application of digital technologies to genes, which is being done by means of big gene data, gene technologies could not realize their full potential. 
The greatest potential for radically altering our way of life can be found at the intersection of these groundbreaking technologies. All processes of the life world get digitized. Autonomous cars are taking over the streets, blockchain technologies decentralize the internet, cryptocurrencies attack the relevance of banks, smart cities get developed. Yet if humans remain the same, all of these processes could not unfold a significant part of their impact. Smart cities need upgraded humans. Elon Musk's Neuralink and all the other companies, institutes, and task forces which work on brain-computer interfaces will have the most significant impact on the future of human flourishing within the forthcoming decades. Computers are in the process of getting smaller and of entering our bodies so that we turn into upgraded humans who can interact efficiently with their environment within smart cities and have the appropriate means for dealing with aging the worst mass murderer in the world. This development goes along with new challenges related to digitization, whereby the coming about of the internet panopticum is the most serious of all of them. The social condition arises in which all of our traces could be connected with each other and could be under permanent surveillance. Since last year, China has fully embraced such digital possibilities and will associate a social value to each action. And we've probably, most of us have already seen sort of the episode nose dive from Black Mirror where exactly such a structure um, get, get dealt with. Europe, on the other hand, has introduced rather rigid data protection regulations which undermine the possibilities of data collection and the realization by means of establishing correlations, for example, between genetic data and health issues. Both political attitudes have an enormous amount of political implications. From a naive point of view, it could be said that China promotes security, whereas Europe cherishes the normal freedom, which is the central achievement of the Enlightenment process. However, such a simple-minded and simplistic dualistic analysis does not do justice to the multifaceted implications of the new uses of digital technologies. And there are a great amount of plausible personal as well as political reasons for digitally collecting data. And that means also to rethink the meaning of data as it's been um, employed in, in European context. We've always been cyborgs. After the shift of information processing from the analog to the digital world of computers, the process of mobilizing these systems has emerged from cumbersome personal computers to much more practical smartphones. In order to be able to access digital information even more quickly and easily, in order to guarantee that an efficient interaction between us and autonomous cars, the Internet of Things, and all the other as aspects of a smart city can be realized, it's necessary to integrate computers more intimately into our bodies. This is exactly what we're working on intensely. The individual components that currently exist in the smartphone would therefore have to be replaced by new devices. The computer monitor has become a smartphone interface, which is now in the process of connecting ever closer to the human optic nerves. Digital classes, such as the Google classes, which are no longer produced, are only a transitional medium in this respect and will be increasingly integrated into people. Google has already developed contact lenses that are able to measure the glucose value of the eye's tear fluid. Diabetics have to check this daily which is usually done by taking blood samples through injections. The implantation of lenses in the eye and the subsequent immediate stimulation of optic nerves would be the obvious next developmental step. If there is no user interface left, it makes sense to also integrate the chip into the body. At present, the outside of the hand between the thumb and the index finger is widely used for having a chip, as it can easily be used to open doors. The Swedish company already offers the employees to have the chip for this purpose, and they can then open doors and or buy stuff in, the, in a vending machine. It's obvious that the system will be used as a versatile key replacement and much more in the not too distant future. However, the possibilities of such a chip go far beyond this simple use, since it's in principle already an equivalent computer replacement today. Without an additional external device, the control of such a chip must also be revolutionized. 
Just as a mouse and the keyboard have been replaced by wiping in speech technology, new control elements are also required for an implanted computer. Already five years ago is when I was, uh, when I, uh, was teaching here at JCU, a student of mine used the control wristband Myo, M-Y-O, for an in-class presentation which is connected to the computer via Bluetooth and enables the wearer to control a PowerPoint presentation by means of gestures. So she had a strap around her arm and then, which costs something like 200, 200 euros. And then you make sort of the sliding move and, and, and you can move the, uh, from one slide to the other or zoom in and zoom out. Gesture control system radically changed the choreography of man-machine interaction. A system integrated into the body could also be operated in this way so that no more wiping over device surfaces and no external mouse is required. Neither an analog nor a digital keyboard will be necessary for text input either. Voice commands can already be employed. Meanwhile, however, intensive work is being done to avoid spelling or pronunciation by trying to translate thoughts directly into digital information. This means that only thoughts will be necessary to compile, compile a text by means of a print computer interface. A team led by Tanja Schultz from the University of Bremen was responsible for fundamental research in this field. In the meantime, Facebook has taken up the idea and employs a team of 60 people to put this knowledge into practice. The future of typing is thinking. The personal computer turned into smartphones, which will get reduced to the size of a small chip by means of which our bodies get upgraded towards their transhuman existence. Is this a categorically new development? Are we going beyond our previous humanity here? Are we becoming cyborgs now? It is central for this assessment of these new technologies that we have always been cyborgs. The word cyborg means cybernetic organism, whereby cybernetic comes from the ancient Greek work Kubernetes, it means helmsman, sort of the steers person of a ship. Cyborgs are therefore controlled organisms. Control already happens with us becoming human. In philosophy, human beings were usually defined by their ability to speak, by their ability to use language. Homo sapiens sapiens, sapere, um, knowledge is always being connected to sort of pro giving, being able to give propositional uh, accounts in a propositional manner. So um, learning language is actually our first upgrade, which our parents provide us with, with which, with which our environment our, um, uh, provides us with our culture. So it's instead of the traditional account, um, which, which, which was given that it's sort of the divine spark coming from somewhere outside, it is actually an upgrade from outside. So we are being turned into cyborgs by our parents upgrading us with language. Our cyborgization continues with the acquisition of new skills, such as learning mathematics, history, etc. However, a new dynamic is currently occurring. Control is being exponentiated, for example, through genome editing and brain computer interfaces. Even smaller chips are migrating into our bodies where they form interfaces with nerve cells or organs in order to collect valuable information about our bodies using sensors. These technological developments continue a process that began with our first upgrade in language development. With the integration of digital technologies into our humanity, new possibilities as well as serious challenges arise. Both aspects are related to total surveillance. And these are the ones we, we, we desperately need to think about very carefully. We've got a personal interest in data collection. This process has enormous advantage in many respects. For example, the constant monitoring of one's own body could be decisive for the readiness to combat aging related processes. As soon as a blood sugar level cholesterol level or blood pressure seems to change in a problematic way, people could be digitally warned so that the problem can be addressed as soon as it arises and not only when it's well advanced. Even a predictive maintenance of humans might be possible on the basis of these technologies. And we already know some process of, of predictive um, um, maintenance technologies also in humans, but so far predictive maintenance is primarily being used in machines. 
Sensors within a plane can tell us that a specific part of the engine is likely to become dysfunctional within the next six months. So, so far it, 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 it fully works, but we know that chances are high that within the next six months it will become dysfunctional. So we get the sensors say warning. And so we can replace this part so that no risk for human lives in this respect has to occur. With RFID chips, radio frequency identification chips entering the human body, we can realize the predictive maintenance of human health. Researchers at Tufts University have already developed a tooth-mounted sensor um, which tracks every bite someone is making. Um, so if you yesterday had you know, uh, too much of a, a pizza and, 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 and beer, and then it might tell you, so if you want to continue living longer, then maybe today, today you should watch your diet. Further, such sensors could make up an entire internet of bodily things where the chips within the body can start interacting. Things um, which can then interact, uh, and the internet of bodily things can then interact with the regular internet of things. The possibilities associated with this type of body monitoring are enormous and are likely to be of significant relevance in combating aging-related processes. And here the aspect of human flourishing comes in. Technologies have always increased the likelihood of, of our flourishing, and human beings have a great variety of associated goals. Yet there are some challenges which are troublesome for most of us, and, and one of these challenges is the process of aging. So two thirds of all deaths are relating to aging related processes. And the more personalized data we have concerning the correlations between genes and aging, lifestyle choices and well-being, and genes and well-being, the more reliable our data is for biotechnological research and medical interventions. Hence, it's, it's strongly in our personal interest that our personalized data enters the big data computers so that correlations between genes and quality of life can be realized. Based on this research, diseases can be treated, aging can be dealt with, and human flourishing can be promoted. All these issues are the, in the interest of most human beings. This is where the, where the aspect of human flourishing comes into play. Technologies have always increased the likelihood of a fulfilled life, and humans have a wide variety um, of goals. So it's probably as many, as many concepts of what the good, good life is as there are human beings. But there are some challenges which are problematic for, for most of us. Um, and, and here, the process of aging is definitely one of the central ones. There, there have been psychological studies um, which show that more than 90% um, of people identify, uh, identify a, a longer health span with, with a better quality of life, either be it as an intrinsic, intrinsically valuable or um, as instrumentally uh, valuable. So an increased health span is ex extremely, extremely important for, for the good life. And maybe it's, it's one of the few things which we can actually sort of generalize, which, which applies to most people. Otherwise, the concepts of the good vary very much from, from human being um, to, to human being. Besides our, besides our personal interest in, in, in having more information and finding out more about correlations between genes and, 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 and health and, and diseases. Um, we, there's also political interest in data collection. So the greatest potential for radical change in our way of life lies at the intersection of digital and genetic technologies. A central prerequisite for the application of the latest techniques is the availability of data on correlations between genes and diseases and psychological and physiological characteristics. As these are the prerequisites for the application of improving gene techniques, such as genome editing, selection after artificial insemination and pre-implantation diagnostics, as well as bioprinting. The relevance of collecting a wide range of personalized digital data goes beyond reasons related to individual flourishing. Collecting digital data is also relevant for policymaking, for international as well as national political decisions, as well as for all areas of economic processes. The following examples only provide a brief selection of reasons why not collecting data cannot be a realistic option for us. So far, I've not yet mentioned the most important reason for accepting entering further into and embracing 
sort of that internet panopticon. The central reason that we live in a globalized world and that data is the new oil, as many experts stress. Actually, this is sort of a bit, over, it's not overstated, but obviously data is not oil. Uh, oil is sort of a natural substance, but data is, um, is intellectual property. But they've got this similar, the same function because oil means power as well as financial flourishing and that same applies to digital data. So given this realization, not collecting digital data cannot be a realistic option. Digital data is the central pillar for economic flourishing. There are other pillars like engineering or natural resources. Still the use of all the other sectors can only be realized in the best possible manner if data is being taken into consideration. And the importance of data will continue to increase in the future as more precise and specialized data becomes available. Countries and institutions which embrace the internet panopticon have the best possible foundation for realizing an economic flourish. And so far here, sort of we've got the libertarian version in the United States and we've got the more, and the, and the more authoritarian version in China, which uh, particularly promising in this respect or particularly effective. Google, Facebook and China are the significant players concerning the collection of digital data. In the US, digital data is primarily being collected by big companies. The Chinese solution seems to be even more efficient. Um, as in China, a social credit system will or has been universally applied from, two, two thousand, from last year onwards which enables the collection of all digital traces. The amount of digital data which gets collected in this manner can hardly be under, underestimated. The more digital data becomes available, the more political, scientific, and financial well-being can be realized. Europe, on the other hand, has institutionalized data protection regulations, which go against the possibility of a helpful collection of digital data. It had good intentions, but it undermines many of the most fundamental European interests. Digital data for scientific research, political decision-making process, as well as economic flourishing will not be available, yet it will be needed. Thereby, it can be expected that the consequences for Europe will be de de devastating ones, as Europe will have to pay China to get hold of the data needed for all the uh, enterprises. I mean, so far, it's already the case that China is publishing uh, more peer-reviewed papers than the United States. And, 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 and obviously data for, for, for scientific endeavors, for scientific research is also a central, central aspect. And it's related that now China has even, has already overtaken the United States in that respect. And China will continue to collect more and more digital data and consequently we gain more economic as well as political power. Europe's economy, on the other hand, will not be able to compete with China. The main reason why the Chinese will continue to visit Rio will be its rich cultural history, its great variety of fascinating culinary experiences like the Colosseum, the Louvre, Neuschwanstein, Pizza, Kaiserschmarrn, and the Swiss cheese fondue. Yet we'll get paid, the Europeans will get paid for performing traditional dances for the Chinese and for dressing up in our traditional local clothes like Roman gladiators here in Rome. Yet there'll be no significant interest in, our, in us as partners in research or for economic reasons. These implications of not, us not collecting data will have an enormous relevance for our financial well-being. It will decline significantly. The middle class will be the first interest group which will strongly realize the consequences of these developments. They will not be able to afford the latest cars, have several vacations a year and be able to work in a well-paid job with a decent university education. Whenever people are worse off than they used to be, even relatively, they look for scapegoats. Someone must be responsible for their social state. Claim is usually given to members of minority groups, immigrants, or the weak others in general. So if, if this is the case, the extremist parties will get elected and the tension within the society will increase, civil war becomes inevitable. All these reflections make it practically inevitable to embrace the internet panopticon. As we'll cherish our personal as well as our economic well-being and do not wish to be worse off than our ancestors. Both interests mentioned above are closely linked to and can be promoted intensely by means of the collection of data. 
This is the central reason why the collection of digital data is a pragmatic must-have. And so far, I have not yet heard a good reply which renders these uh, reflections implausible or invalid. I'm not happy about these reflections myself or, or the outcome of these reflections. Um, yet there seems no other way out. We need to embrace the Internet panopticon, which goes along with the loss of privacy. This is problematic. This is the decisive issue which we need to focus on. The current system, I try to avoid giving away digital data whenever it's possible. I try to avoid doing so given, given the setup we have and given also the setup who benefits from the data collection. I'm aware that the insights which you gain by analyzing digital data are enormous. Many insights are closely linked to goals which many people, including me, regard as beneficial for our flourishing. The challenge which we need to confront for having the digital data stored and analyzed are enormous, but thinking makes me conclude that pragmatically there is no other way out. Um, yet many elements of the system need to be altered so that it can be guaranteed that the people will benefit from the collection of digital data. So we need to develop, and this is what I'm suggesting also in, in my, in, and I develop further in my forthcoming monograph, um, that we need to develop a democratic usage of, of digital data. I explained that computers are getting being smaller and entering our bodies so that we become upgraded humans who can interact efficiently with the environment in smart cities and have the, have the means to cope with aging the world's worst mass murderer. This development is accompanied by new challenges related to digitalization. All these considerations make it practically necessary to promote the comprehensive collection of data, especially big gene data as we value both our personal prosperity and our economic prosperity and do not want to be worse off than our ancestors. If we, we, if we are to promote our prosperity, we need to address these challenges and make the appropriate policy arrangements. In this way, our average health span can be significantly extended, which further increases the likelihood of our flourishing. You would like to emphasize that full monitoring doesn't have to mean giving up on negative freedom. Um, total surveillance is not just a tool for the powerful to increase their power. At least it doesn't have to, have to be the case. It depends on the specific political arrangements, how this can be avoided, an abuse of, of, of power, an abuse of, of the digital data which gets collected. And there is, of course, a danger that such an internet panopticon can be used in this way. I mean, if the wrong kind of political leaders are there or have access to the data, then so like in, in a surveying system, a suppressive system of um, on an unprecedented scale could be, could be implemented. It would confront us with a monetary system of unprecedented intensity. And that's the main reason why there is such a widespread fear of such structures. And I can understand that. Um, it's not the, 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 that the fears are unfounded, but one way dealing with this fear, and that is one of the, one of the central elements which, which also need to, which need to be implemented when one has one, like a government collecting digital data, then um, is that algorithms should be primarily responsible for monitoring. In this case, the likelihood of human abuse at least is reduced. Psychological studies confirm that people prefer algorithmic to human judgment, which seems to imply that humans are less afraid of being monitored by algorithms than by other people. Algorithms can be programmed to take human rights into account. If humans are primarily responsible for monitoring, the risk of abuse is, is, is increases. However, this is another insight highlighted here. Many of our personal interests can be promoted by big data analysis based on personalized long-term monitoring. And personalized data is necessary when it comes to gaining knowledge about the relationship between genes and health, um, genes and well-being, or lifestyle and human development. That's why we sort of need this. The chips in us will, will, will provide us with a per, per, personalized um, surveillance and personalized data throughout uh, our lives. So large data correlations on all these topics require personalized data. The more data we have, the more correlations can be identified. Even if all these data were available, there would be many more moral challenges. Who should have access to which data? Who collects the data? Which goals can be promoted with the help of the data? 
Advertising flourishes particularly strongly due to data collection. Should advertisers have the right to buy data from the government if this is the institution responsible for the collection? And at the moment, I assume that it must be the state that is responsible for collecting the data because any other organization or institution that has all this information at its disposal would soon be extremely powerful, which would give an enormous political influence, which would undermine the political um, structures uh, in, a, in, a, in a system. So this pre pre selection of questions shows how groundbreaking the implementation of such structures is. However, we need data for economic well-being, for scientific research, for promotion of well-being, and for the elimination of aging, the worst mass murderer of all. The achievements of all these objectives is so important that not collecting data is not a practically realistic option. With the help of the European social maybe establishing a European version, a free version of a social credit system based on the recognition of the relevance of negative freedom, we can further promote a wide variety of lifestyles and the health and welfare-related interests that depend on digital data collection. And whoever claims that these reflections are absurd might wish to consider the following statements. A pioneer in aviation, Wilbur Wright said the following 1901. I quote, I quote Confess that in 1901, I said to my brother Orwell that man would not fly for 50 years, unquote. The father of radio, Lady Forrest, was still certain in 1926, I quote. So I repeat that while theoretically and technically television may be feasible, yet commercially and financially, um, I consider it an impossibility, a development of which we need not waste little time in dreaming. And the leading computer expert, Ken Olson, president of Digital Equipment Corp, assumed in 1977, quote, there is no reason for any individual to have a computer in his home, unquote. And these remarks could give us further food for thought. So many thanks for your attention, and I'm now looking forward to our, our exchanges on this topic. Many thanks, Stefan. That's a very positive uh, advocacy of uh, enhancing humans and uh, more data being shared for enabling much greater human flourishing. You had a nice phrase that smart cities need upgraded humans, that when there are more small computers inside us, it's uh, giving very useful information, which will be in all of our interests. But can you say a bit more about when people say they don't want to be upgraded humans in the sense when they may say that they don't trust the providers of these devices uh, they don't want to give more information to people who might then advertise things to us which will help us to be worse versions of ourselves rather than good versions of ourselves because these advertisements will know exactly the right time to capitalize on our weaknesses or indeed that they will empower uh, dictatorial governments who will use what they've uh, observed to eliminate diversity of thinking in the way that for example, in China, you're not allowed to have the various thoughts. Uh, if you express ideas about Tiananmen Square or about Taiwan or about the Muslim Uyghurs, uh, you lose many points. And uh, currently, you're allowed to think these things, but you aren't allowed to say them. But in the future, if we are enhanced, maybe that will take away one more element of our freedom. So what do you say to people who say they don't want to be that kind of enhancement? Exactly. This is sort of the central element. So on the one hand, and, and these were um, exactly the two structures which you stress. So on the one hand, we've got the U.S. American libertarian way of dealing with digital data. And in whose interest are the data here? And here the data are mostly collected by private companies in order to, to maximize their own financial flourishing and, and, and uh, in their own financial interest. Um, and so far, actually, we don't there's not much, people are not so worried about giving away the data in that way because everyone thinks it's, it's just a, it's a free goodie we receive from Google and, and Facebook. And sort of we place our smartphones next to, next to our beds, knowing that it's easy that sort of surveillance in our, in our private sphere is extremely easy um, to, to um, turn on the camera, turn on the microphone. Um, and the data which gets stored there, I mean, it's, it's basically in the hands of a private company and, and um, sort of um, the rules and who has access to that, it's, 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 it's 
very open that the people working at the companies could get all of data, could be used against the individuals in, in whatever manner. So that's the, the libertarian way of dealing with it. On the other hand, we have, um, so it is not in our interest. Um, it is, we just get little goodies from it, but it, 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 it's not in the interest of the people. On the other hand, we have, we have a system as in China, where we would have to fear the, um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's an authoritarian system. And, and this is actually, I think with respect to data collection, it is, it is much more promising in this respect because they can even enforce, or the, and they are enforcing the collection of digital data. Um, but um, here it is collected with norms and values which cannot be reconciled with, with sort of our, you know, the achievements of the enlightenment, with the achievements like in particular freedom, which is central. So we can all live according to, with our, our idiosyncratic way of how we want to live our, our lives as long as we don't harm um, or don't directly harm another person. But here, it's used in order to, to sanction the individuals on, a, on an institutional, on a political manner. Um, and, and so this is obviously not an, not an option which we can cherish, which we would want either. So um, in, in both of these ways, there are significant challenges. So, um, but, so in order to have the benefits, these benefits which I talked about, which are benefits which, it, which are in most people's interest, we need to find a way where we need to find a way where we do get hold of um, the great variety of digital data. And that in the end um, it can be realized only in the most efficient way. Um, if, if it's a governmental institution uh, which collects all the data because they can sort of legally implement that the data gets collected. But on the other hand, um, we don't want, and, and sort of in this way, we also avoid the risks of um, of, of private companies becoming quasi-political players, becoming more influential, more powerful than the political institutions themselves. Um, however, then one could say, if, if this is legally enforced, isn't that expropriation? Isn't the government, because one of the, so there are two big theories concerning, two central theories concerning why we should, why we should cherish privacy. And, and one of the, so they are not mutually exclusive. One of the theories is related to sanctions and the other theory is related to intellectual property. And um, so basically we cherish privacy because the data which go along with it, they represent our intellectual property. We mix our personality with something external. So um, one could wonder if the, if the government now ask us, not only asks us, but forces us takes away the digital data, aren't they, isn't expropriation then what occurs? Isn't that something uh, in, in, that would undermine the, the, the you know, pluralistic way of a liberal society? Um, however, expropriation would not be the case if the government then pays for something which is in our general interest and takes care of something which is in our, in the common interest. And what is in our common interest? And, 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 and that's, I think that's, a, that's an, an amazing achievement which we have in, in, the, um, in, in Europe. And, that's, um, and this is the availability of a public health insurance. And the health insurance is extremely, extremely expensive. And, and so far, even the, in, in the various European um, countries, sort of what um, they, they have a public health insurance, but um, the availability even of what these public, um, public universal health insurances offer varies significantly from, from country to country. So in, 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 sorry, in Italy, it's, it's, it's not as good as in Germany. I mean, but that's clear because in Italy, you only pay 10% of an average salary of 2,000 euros, whereby in, in, in Germany, you pay 15% out of an average salary of, of 3,000 euros. So obviously what they can provide is, is um, what would be covered by the um, public health insurance is much better. In, in Italy, you would have to pay for um, sort of you would have to privately care for certain treatments, which because they're not included in the in the public health insurance. So, if by means of the government 
So government enforces us collecting all the data, and personalized data, stores it in a, in a specific manner, well protected, needs to be very well protected, primarily alg algorithms having the right to, to access and processes. Um, but then the financial, so, and, and the depersonalized data goes to companies making the research and so on, on and whoever needs them, we would have to specify exactly. But then the financial gain which we receive from, um, from the selling, from the handling of the data um, would, be, would be such that it, it's basically a way of at least partially or maybe fully financing a public health insurance. And uh, that can, and sort of a public health insurance is in all of our interests, more than 90%. The majority, most people agree that an expanded health span is something, is something which is, you know, increases the likelihood of individual flourishing, increases the likelihood of an individual living a good life. Um, so, um, so in this way, and this is why I didn't directly answer, answer your question. I basically said, no, it's really a completely different system of handling the data which would be needed. Um, and in this way, basically, it wouldn't be expropriation, but it would be um, sort of the collecting of the data would be a way of, of, of us paying for, fully, partially paying for very well-functioning public health insurance, which is in all of our interests. So we've got a great number of comments and questions arising. On the whole, I'm going to try and prioritize the questions in the Q&A, which have the most upvotes. So some of the audience might take a moment or two to quickly look up and down the list of questions. And if you like a question particularly, put your pointer on the thumbs up. And if later you change your mind, you want to deprioritize a question which maybe has already been answered, you can uh, undo your thumbs up. There are also lots of fascinating comments in the chat. We've got people supporting you. Uh, examples with, uh, for example, the availability of pandemic data published by various governments, a point made by PNJ. Uh, it has been valuable to many uh, people in uh, identifying a possible uh, uh, ways to respond to the pandemic possible treatments. So it's clear there are many benefits. But I want to put you a point that various people have raised, for example, Wojtek Bujinski, who says that what you were saying earlier sounded a bit like a political pitch, China is awesome, the EU sucks. You didn't seem to be saying so much about the downsides of living in what might be called a communist authoritarian state. I and mean, you've said uh, government could do a great job uh, in contrast to businesses which cannot be trusted. But isn't it the case that governments likewise can fail just as businesses can fail? Of course, yeah. Obviously, if the wrong kind of government was at place, and, and unfortunately we in Europe also have several examples uh, if they were in control of the data, I would be pretty worried. Um, and so I, I understand um, I understand the reactions and worries associated to such a handling of the data. And, and, and many thanks also for the question because I in no way want to defend. It's not an affirmation of the, of the Chinese system or that we should implement the Chinese system in Europe. We need to find a European democratic way of doing so. However, the one thing which I wanted to stress and want to sort of take over um, is sort of the, the collection of data. But in a primarily obviously being processed by um, processed then by algorithms, reducing the direct human access in, um, in, in order to reduce the abuse of the data. And so um, in China, we've got, you know, we've got clear sort of a very rigid system of values and norms associated to this way of structuring um, um, the society. So if you, if you have the wrong kind of sexual behavior, if you have deviant, f strange friends, then you get punished for something. Then you might not have, have the right to book a, a, a plane ticket for a year. Don't, don't have the right to book in, 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 stay in a four and five star hotel, not being able to, or getting slower internet access. And you know, it is, it is, it is, this is really, the problem here is however, um, and that's related to the sanction theory of privacy. So um, we have very rigid values and norms which cannot be reconciled with the European way of doing these things in, um, um, 
um, in, in China. So at the same time, and also to, to guarantee that we cherish the achievement um, of, of the enlightenment, freedom, plurality, what, what needs to be connected. Um, to, if, we, if we wanted to restructure the system in the, way, in the way just sort of suggested, would also be to reduce sanctions. Um, only sanctions need to occur whenever, um, whenever direct harm to another, to another individual occurs. So every human should have the right to live according to his or her own understanding of what it means to live a, live a, live a good life. In the sense, um, and that would already mean a, a lot of, a, a enormous sense of, 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 of revisions would have to occur. Um, for example, um, I mean, yeah, the UK is actually a wonderful example. The UK is, is one of the few places where it's, 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 it's legitimate to have a child with three biological parents, um, but only for the sake of if the mother has a mitochondrial disease. Um, however, um, why shouldn't that be allowed? You know, there's no good reason why it shouldn't be allowed for a lesbian couple or, 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 or three parents who want to have a child in this way. And um, if, if, uh, if this is a case, and maybe the three people love each other and want to be um, found a family, um, then they should also have the right to get in marriage. There is no harm being done to any other person. There's, there's this, in, the, in the interest of a, of a, of a, of a government to um, promoting in marriages, because marriages, every marriage, the members of the, of, the, of the household pay for each other if someone gets bankrupt. So it's in the interest also of a, of a, of a government to, to, to establish marriages. If three people marriages, other, these three people are also financially dependent on each other. So um, that would be one of the re revisions. So as an opening up, much more plurality would be needed. If, if much more plurality is given on a, on a, on a legal, on a, on a moral and an institutional way, then we don't have to fear the sanctions anymore. Because, um, um, and, 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 and this is the central worry which has been mentioned, sort of the sanctions against the Uyghurs uh, in, in China, against non-established, non non-approved uh, non be, uh, behavior. So this is the very why, this is the central worry why we, we cherish privacy because we think others either on a on a on an individual or an institutional or on a governmental level on a legal level um something could happen um, which limits uh, which limits us which 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 sanctions us um for our behavior whereby our behavior is in no way harming any other other person another example could be for example um incest among consenting adults. There is no good reason why incest among consenting adults should be illegal. It is, it, it is illegal in Germany, for example. Um, um, however, it's, it's merely a sexual report between, um, it, between two competent adults who decide, two or more competent adults who decide to, to, to be intimate with one another. And so this is, these are just examples of what I'm saying. Yeah, in order, we need to increase plurality, diversity of different lifestyles much further than it is. And in that, in that way, um, um, we, we, we don't have to fear being sanctioned from the data which is available in some specific place collected by the government. At the same time, so for our data, we get paid for by means of the uh, public health insurance. But on the other hand, um, we don't have to fear the sanctions which are related um, uh, to the data being collected only in the circumstances where actually it's good that someone um, gets sanctioned. So if, if, if there is a murderer, <laughs> A murder of an innocent toddler or rapist, then it's, 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 it's very good that the person gets sanctioned. So only when proper harm is being done, um, um, then sort of this, this, this data can be used in order um, um, to find the person and to sanction the person. But otherwise, there's, you know, that's what I mean by opening up the plurality, by taking into consideration the achievements of the, uh, 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 of the enlightenment of, of European central moral notions. And, and, and so it would be not, it, it has nothing to do at all with the values and norms in China. It's sort of a European value and norm system, just in combination with a collection of, of digital data. There's such a lot of fascinating topics there, and we've got a good foundation set out. So I'm going to try and move more quickly now. 
I'll try and ask the questions more quickly and I'll also be appreciate, Stefan, if you can also answer uh, yeah. quickly as well. I mean, everything you say is fascinating, but I want to give a chance to cover a range of topics. You talked about plural pluralism and we should have a plurality of, toler of things that we tolerate. And there's a comment in the chat, which I think is very uh, profound. It's by Alan Ziegler, who says that what uh, the American approach is, it's also plural. It's if you have enough competing entities involved rather than trusting a single all-powerful uh, state, single all-powerful party, then uh, no one of these can gain undue or overweening power. So how important for you is the idea of the separation of powers rather than just saying it'd be good if there's a government which does things wisely? Um, the central worry is um, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if, the, if the institutions collect the information, um, it is sort of, um, it, they become political players and they undermine political decision makings. And, and, and this seems to be really a crucial barrier because so much power is connected with having that information. And, and a second reason um, why I, I'm, um, uh, I think sort of the American way is also, is, is sort of the um, worrying um, is, is problematic is, 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 is sort of the, how well the data is protected, what can be done at this institution who have that power. Even the abuse against individuals by, you know, the data protection is something which can be better guaranteed on the basis of, on, on, a, on, a, on a political system where we have the clear enforced guidelines that this is something which officially must be done in this way. Of course, it needs to be guaranteed that then not the wrong kind of parties um, 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 become, become the leaders. And that is a challenge. So these are two central reasons which seem to go uh, against that. I guess the third one, which is another extremely important one is um, here the information um, we are the products. The consumers are the products. The computers, maybe, maybe the consumers are not even the products, but they are the workers. And, and it's sort of the, 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 the money, the finance, financial gain is then in the end is, is in the interest of, the, of, the, uh, of these institutions, of the companies. So if we as a democracy want to have a democratic use of the data, um, then we need to revise who has access to the data and we need to move away from the American, um, from the American libertarian model of treating the data. To, to guarantee, to guarantee a, a sustainable way of financing a public health insurance. And that seems to be you know, such an important achievement which makes it worth the shift towards that system. Not everybody in the chat agrees that the right way to characterize the American system is libertarianism. Uh, people will say that the, America has a, a plurality of approaches, just as the transhumanist movement has a plurality of uh, political uh, tendencies. But let me move on, if I may, to if we can't trust humans so much whether it's business or if it's politicians, can we trust the algorithms instead? So one of the questions at the top of the pile just now is by Liam Myron. Uh, we are used currently to human government, but what's the roadmap to get us to a situation where bene beneficent algorithms take these decisions in ways that we humans are happy? Is that uh, some incredible? Because after all, many algorithms today don't seem to take the wrong decisions. Algorithms about what, say, good free speech on Facebook often uh, come down very cack-handedly. And the algorithms promoting various things on YouTube, there's lots of questions about them. So are you looking forward to algorithms sooner taking much better decisions than we flawed humans? Extremely important question because the, sort of there's a very of, of algorithms con, con containing um, versions of discrimination, um, which we take over from our, the structures in our society because they are being programmed by human beings. And, and, the, and I, I think um, this very can be clearly addressed and, and the best way um, um, to demonstrate that is, is already um, are the Emerson Go markets where we already have a system in place where, where individual monitoring takes place enforced on, on, a, on, a, on an obligatory manner takes place. So there was an account in a, in a, in a big American newspaper by a woman of color. And, and she described her own shopping experiences 
in regular American, U.S. American supermarkets. And basically, wherever she went, um, people looked at her with suspicion. They were wondering, you know, oh, there's a woman of color. Is she probably going to steal? So and she saw the glances of the others. And uh, when she had the experience, when she used the Amazon Go market, where basically she was, she was, um, she had to sign in using an Amazon account, and wherever she went, she was sort of followed by the machines. Um, um, she was mo permanently monitored. No one was, no one was looking at her anymore. So um, everyone, it was clear. Everyone who's a marketer is, is, is signed in. Everyone, basically, whatever they need and take out gets automatically paid for. Um, so, so it, no one was suspicious in, in these circumstances because everyone was under surveillance. And and if if this occurs, and this is this is this is gets gets transported, uh, or moved from from supermarket to the general national level, then um, it can also be expected that discrimination, which we still have in place um, um, in, on, on many different levels on individual basis, um, get, gets altered, gets, once we know that there are no longer, um, um, as in the case of one of color, uh, high likelihood of stealing the people thing, and that's why they, they look at her. But in the other system, it, it's no longer the case. Then also the, the sort of the worries, the discrimination in the thoughts of the people, in the way how they look at other people gets altered. So it's, it could also actually be a way of becoming, of moving away from problematic discriminatory structures. And, and it, because it doesn't, so the algorithms here um, don't, don't concern, do not have to be programmed with specific stereotypes, but they merely monitor individual behavior. Um, 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 this is a way of also not having to program discriminatory, not having to program in uh, anything which is sort of uh, based on human discrimination. So actually it could be a way of moving away from discriminatory algorithms. And I'm sure that doesn't answer all the, all the questions, but uh, it already seems to be a move into a better direction than the system we live in right now. So you can rightly point out some algorithms have uh, functioned better than the human systems that were there before. And it's true that algorithms sometimes display some bias, but after all, we humans often have subconscious biases which are harder to track. But I mean, do you accept that technology generally does have dual usage. It could be used as in this case, algorithms for good, but often the same algorithms with slight tweaks can have a destructive consequences. You mentioned earlier about uh, flights and TV and radio and computers and how it's sort of after a period of time, they all came forward quickly and delivered lots of goodness. But don't these same technologies also allow for greater spread of propaganda? And uh, even airplanes can be flown into large buildings causing havoc. So uh, isn't there a concern that we can't just trust the technology? There has to be something more than the technology to decide which algorithms are being uh, uh, pursued. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is sort of one of the, I guess, this is the central varying also concerning having the data stored in one specific place with, with, with governmental access. Because being in a democratic system, there's also the possibility, you know, democracies um, um, uh, with elections, <laughs> new presidents become the heads of state or and, and have access to the data. So, and we cannot guarantee that the ones who get uh, newly elected are always the ones who who act in the best interest, who, who are not, who don't have any problematic fascist ideas maybe in their heads and, and directions in which they use. And here, this is, this is, one, of the, this is one of the central worries actually. Um, and, and we see that in, on, on various, in various um, countries in Europe that they are having, they've elected um, people who, who might be where in whose case it might not be so ideal if they had access to, to all the data. And it, this is also, I mean, we just, there was a wonderful um, um, example. I think it was a Stanford researcher who based on, um, I think it was a, on, on, on Tinder photo, foco, uh, on, on Tinder foco, photos uh, managed to realize that um, based even on having one to five, three, five photos, it is also possible to, to identify um, sort of the sexual orientation 
with an incredibly high likelihood of the person in question, which in a, in a country, with countries where there's a, a certain discrimination against people of a specific sexual orientation that, you know, could have devastating consequences uh, for the people in question. So the risks are, are enormous, but this is up to us. The thing is, um, it is, so the dangers, as you rightly said, with every new technology, there, there, there's significant danger. The more powerful a technology is, the more, 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 the more severe are the possibilities of, of abuse of that technology. But um, we, it's us as, as, as citizens, as, as people of these nations, we need to fight for it. That's what we've always been doing in the Enlightenment. We on various levels, be it philosophers, politicians, scientists, and the people have to take care that sort of the data or the technologies are used in our interest. And here in our, that's, that's why I also stress the data needs to be used in a democratic interest, not in the interest of an authoritarian ruler or not in the interest of, of the big companies. And, and this is what I'm trying to realize. The dangers are there, but um, we need to accept the dangers. Otherwise, the data is, is not being used as it's currently the case in Europe, which will, I guess, rather lead to um, to, to civil war in Europe, it will definitely not promote your European flourishing. And so even though I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm not fully happy with that solution myself, but I don't have a better one to offer. And I haven't heard a good counter argument in the sense of what else could be done as a better. Well, one thing else that could be done is something I think you've touched on, which is uh, making enhanced humans. And uh, David Schumacher wants to ask, uh, could we use technology to enhance the ethical nature of humans? So that instead of many of these decisions being swayed by our sort of primitive, tribal, egocentric, uh, deceptive nature, which we all have to greater or lesser extent, maybe technology could make us more ecologically minded, more altruistic, more in control of our impulses. Is that something that uh, you see is on the roadmap and would, would you advocate that? I mean, this is definitely something which, I mean, this is something which in, in, in bioethical circles has been discussed intensely in the past five, seven, eight years. Um, and, and I'm not, ex I can see sort of various specific drugs having the right kind of influences, pro-social pro behavior, more accepting behavior. Um, However, in all of these cases where, where a specific type of behavior gets, gets promoted, um, this is also, you know, um, uh, this is as, as double-edged, this is also double-edged sword, which can, have, can be appropriate, it must not be appropriate. So uh, in order to, what would we need? We need a, a specific technology which alters humans such that they always respect other people's autonomy in the appropriate manner. It, it stops harming other people. And, but that's such a complex enterprise. I, I don't, I mean, I'm not excluding the possibility that it can be realized eventually, but it's such a complex enterprise that so far there's, there is no realistic technology available in the near future in, in which we can realize such a um, moral bio enhancement in the appropriate manner, um, unfortunately. And so it, it, that would be a, a great solution, but given, given sort of what we, we, we know of the possibilities of moral bio enhancement, sort of, and, and what actually would have to be realized, I don't think this is a, is a, is a short term or even in the, in the midterm solution is not a realistic option in the as a short-term solution so that's why the other option of having an altered an altered system of dealing with the data is much more realistically uh, uh, realizable thanks well i might point to various things in so-called transformative technology there is a space called transformative technology that looks at using technology to get the same effects as maybe a long course of yoga or mindfulness or meditation but to do it by understanding what's happening in the brains by one set of helmets, smart sensors, and another set of sensors might even stimulate the brains in various ways, not just by music, but also by electrical signals. I recently read a book called The Neural Generation by Tan Li, who is a Vietnamese Australian entrepreneur. And I think that's fascinating. Maybe I hope to come back to that subject on London Futurist soon. 
That's a, it is, and actually I've wrote about that in a, in a German publication, a German monograph, it's entitled Übermensch. Um, there is a section on mindfulness and on the possibilities of, of an enhancing mindfulness. Um, initially, I think James, uh, James Hughes is here as well. He gave a wonderful TED talk on the topic of enhancing mindfulness in Rome many years ago, where I also gave a TED talk. Um, and, and yes, and, and this is, these are different, definitely um, um, very useful tools for altering behavior, for making people aware of, um, of, 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 of interaction or making people more moral, but it doesn't work on a reliable manner for the entire population. That's why this is not a, um, a realistic way of in, in, in generally enhancing uh, humanity and uh, making and, and, and making it obligatory has other um, problematic tools. If it was if it was only beneficial, if it was not a double and any enhancement would not be a double edged sword. So um, mindfulness is a is a wonderful tool. Also traditional mindfulness practice as well as enhanced versions of of mindfulness are extremely helpful for realizing for realizing sort of the relationality, how things interact with each other. And that made it just by, that's what I'm doing with my students in many courses. So I'm just, you know, want them to reflect upon um, a, 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 a nice piece of Florentine steak and think about the various traces and interactions or, or you know, a, a piece of meat from a, from a pig. So where does it come from? Where, like, then you come up to, to factory farming and the poisoning of the soil. You come to carbon dioxide emissions and, and, and the pollution and, and climate change. You come to all the, all the pigs being given. The pigs are very social animals and they suffer enormously. So it's, it's about uh, uh, how to treat animals um, and factory farming, the problematics associated with factory farming. There's always one, one pig which is ill and so you always need to give antibiotics. By giving antibiotics, you have humans eating it and you have um, um, creating the likelihood of having antibiotic resistant cells. Furthermore, uh, rat meat in general increases the risk of colon cancer. So it's, it's another human risk associated to it. So, um, so just by, and that is the type of mindfulness um, meditation, just being confronted with, you know, just thinking about what it means to eat a piece of meat. Um, and, and that usually, and once, once you show and demonstrate how, how animals are slaughtered in, in these uh, food factories, then you know, most people you know, at least turn vegan for a couple of days. Um, so it is, uh, but, so possibilities of altering you know, behavior, making it more moral, making people more aware of interrelations are possible, but not on such a reliable global scale a way that it could be an efficient solution for uh, improving entire uh, society. But it's definitely something like mindfulness, um, you know, considering the interaction as, as integrating, um, as, as an integrative understanding in schools, instead of teaching biology and teaching economics and so on, you, you, you reflect upon the piece of meat and you think about how biology and, and, and economics interact. That should be implemented, I think. So we would have to adapt our, our, the way our humanities are structured into meta-humanities, into integrating you know, the sciences further. Um, but all of these, and, and this would change behavior that would make people more considerate of uh, you know, uh, environmental consequences of animal, animal treatment. But it's not something which is so reliable. That's just one an additional step, one additional tool which ought to be considered, yes. So before I, I take the next question, I'll just give a shout out to a couple of comments which are backing you up there. Uh, the argument is that if we wait for technology to make us better humans, we'll be waiting a long time, but there is a lot of uh, evolutionary inheritance in us that we can actually be very nice people. We can be cooperative as well as being competitive. And so uh, James Hughes draws attention to the book by Nicholas Christakis, Blueprint, The Evolutionary Origins of a Good Society. Um, I believe he, he's a medical uh, writer as well as somebody who writes about evolution, a, a big thinker. But he say I mean, the, the book has lots of considerations that humans do have innate cooperative tendencies. 
And also Alan Ziegel mentions a book by Rutger Bregman, the young Dutch uh, historian. His book is entitled Humankind. Um, I also give a strong thumbs up to that book, but he posits in that book that humanity has evolved basically to be kind and cooperate. We don't really need to be technologically improved in order to flourish in that sense, but the question is why these particular evolutionary tendencies don't flourish always, and maybe it's because of the bad social and political circumstances in which we are found, and also maybe because of some misleading uh, philosophical ideas which we have picked up, which lead us to interpret behavior in different ways. What I want to stress sort of, because you said sort of maybe the right kind of education, the right kind of making people aware with certain theories is sufficient for, for improving human behavior. And here the best example is just look at the leaders in the Third Reich, in the so-called so Third Reich. Um, many of them had a, you know, very good humanistic education. They knew, they've read their Goethe. They've, they've been extremely educated. At the same time, they've been monsters. They've just, you know, um, efficiently killed people, um, killed Jews, killed people with a handicap. Uh, and, and so um, it's not about it, it sort of education alone, unfortunately, and even, even like a well-crowned education, as one can say, which was present in, 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 in Germany at that time as well, is not a guarantee for absolutely brutal and terrible and monstrous behavior. Um, and and one, one thing which at least helps um, um, usually in order to, um, or, or, which seems to be a, a relevant factor, but in itself, it also is not sufficient for guaranteeing a better society, is a certain, a certain, uh, or what at least always needs to be taken into consideration, a certain um, financial well-being, a financial standing. Whenever it's sort of, whenever people are also financially worse off, it's, it's, they try to blame others, sort of that envy factor. So that's why, um, um, Maybe, maybe even democratic systems work only in a, an efficient way, given a certain education and financial standing is given. So that's why um, this is a way of why I'm moving away. I don't, um, it's, it's a very weak stance, transhumanist stance I have, and a weak take on truth in the sense of what I'm putting forward are fic fictive accounts. I'm making sure it's, it's something, these are suggestions. I'm not guaranteeing that this is the final answer, but this is the best I can, it's an as good as it gets ethics. Um, I'm putting forward some suggestions to enter a dialogue and, and, and I'm, I, don't, I don't pretend, I don't claim that this is sort of the final answer. I don't think there is any final answer as possible. The best one can do is always to react to the various situations, put forward reflections and reasons and then to enter a dialogue in order to come up with the you know, best possible uh, way of dealing with it. And, and, and it's, it's a gain to having, to having such a more moderate stance when it comes to philosophical, when it comes to ethical issues, because then there's more of an openness towards the other's perspective and less of a violence being done. I'm the right one and I need to bring the truth to the world, which is, I think, related to a lot of violence and dangers. So that's why, um, um, these are the things that, which I, I think in this, this aspect have ought to be considered. Let's take a question from Natasha Vitamore, who, by the way, agrees with you that many of these topics are more complex than just a, a simple uh, formula in terms of solving them. She says that uh, what affects people's behavior has multiple things, including chemical imbalance or personal history. And so we should be wary of any simple uh, formulas as to what's going to make more people more cooperative or competitive. But the question I want to raise from her we, in this conversation, have largely taken for granted that it's a good thing to have a transhumanist enhancements. But uh, many non-transhumanists continue to argue against such enhancements. They don't like the idea of people having significantly expanded health spans. Many professional ethicists uh, fight against this. I mean, why? I mean, what's the reasoning behind uh, this strong pushback against uh, transhumanist uh, possibilities? It's interesting. Sort of when... 
It's also the case, I mean, when I present, I've established a course, which I'm offering regularly at the university, it's called Post-Human Studies. So here I'm introducing all the ideas to, to a permanently increasing group of students. And they also, when they first, when it, like as, as you mentioned, the example of the health span expansion. Initially, when they get confronted, they say, ah, oh, no, I want to, don't want to, you know, all this, always the same ideas. No, you, I don't want to be older than 80 and it's always getting worse. And then you start, then you start, and you explain the situation better and you give, describe pictures, um, give pictures, and then you see actually altered, an altered understanding. I mean, just when we talk about um, um, expanding the health span as one of the examples, I, I like to, I, I, I like to talk about sort of my experience when I was a child, you know, I was sitting at, I was, I regularly went to, to an island on the North Sea with my parents and I was at the beach and I love building castles made of sand and, 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 and sort of constructing them, seeing them, how they get destroyed by the waves, by the waters. And then, then my mom came, uh, comes at a certain, it was getting dark and said, no, you need to come in, it's getting dinner. And I said, no, just it's fun. I like it. I, this is so wonderful. Now the waves coming closer and I want to build the castle higher. And she says, no, no, but it's, it's getting, you need to come. And, and, and I said, just five more minutes. Give me just, just five more minutes. And it's, it's such a wonderful. And, and, and it's, it's, this seems to be quite a, 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 a fitting analogy to what was lifespan or with health span expansion. So that if you're healthy, if you're enjoying yourselves, if you feel good about the situation in which you are, then you just don't want it to stop. You want five more minutes. And that's sort of what, what my grandmother, I mean, she was in her 90s and she always was, was happy about just having a leeson Lipku and some cookies from Nuremberg, which she loved. This is what she was looking forward to every day. Um, and, and, and even though she was not, maybe she was much else, but, but, but you know, this is just the, the thing she enjoyed. And so she don't want to, to have five more minutes all the time. So once uh, you have something to look forward to and you have something where you intrinsically cherish, you don't want to stop existing. And, and with these stories and narratives, it is, you know, more and more people um, actually understand the relevance and understand this is what actually they have they've always fully real you know fully felt and and sort of many of that applies to to many of the ideas associated um, here with transhuman and in particular with health span expansion um, by, by narratives and stories it is the best rather than abstract philosophical reflections they are to code they don't they don't you don't feel it, you don't get emotionally convinced, but with narratives and, 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 and music and, and, and operas or, or films, there's a way of, of changing the perspectives and making people realize what actually corresponds to their instincts and drives. Many thanks. Uh, what about the GDPR? And Peter Jackson has asked a question. And you weren't very complimentary about the GDPR earlier, and it is uh, one of the most uh, famous uh, European initiatives on data protection. Uh, PNJ suggests that the motivation for GDPR has been about protection of personal autonomy rather than trying to minimize or withhold the data. From. So, if you don't like the GDPR, do you have things that you would put in its place instead? Yeah, I mean, this is exactly, and I, I'm actually in, 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 um, uh, having exchanges, one of the persons who was strongly in, in influential or responsible for, for, for establishing it, for integrating it. And we had exchanges on, on that topic. And um, yes, and, and, and this is exactly what I'm, what I'm putting forward in my forthcoming book on um, we've always been cyborgs and what I've been hinting at um, um, well, with many with sort of the remarks I made earlier on um, it is it is it is the worst arrangement for Europe it is fully undermining our interest both with respect to expanding the health span as well as with the possibility of of, of an economic flourishing so I don't and it's it's Europe is 
is already turning into, into Disneyland. The only reason why the, you know, American and, and Chinese visitors are here because of the history, because of the past, because of you know, cultural diversity which you have. But sort of economically, scientifically, what is happening? What, what does Europe have to offer? That's why, and, and that's why you can note sort of the financial economic decline in, in, in European, in the ver variety of European countries. And, and it's once, and this is the main, maybe not the main, but, but that's one of the main reasons that financial decline um, um, leads to the tensions in, in a society. That's why, uh, and the tensions in the society create an explosion, an implosion of, of the European Union when I talk about the European Union. So yeah, the alternative would have to be some, a system where, where um, privacy is something which needs to be abolished, but, but and the government ought to collect all the data, ought to collect the personalized data, everything that can get a lot of, make it legally enforce it. Maybe um, also um, um, implement like as they do in, in Sweden, they've already offered the possibility of a passport being being integrated as a chip into the human body. Um, that would have to be become the new norm. And in the same way as some vaccinations, which are reliable and without significant side effects, um, have become legally obligatory in the same way chipping a human um, would have to become legally obligatory. And it's, it's you can you can normally when in situ in, in societies where you have something which is not the norm, um, there is a there is a strong reaction to it. Uh, for example, um, there are very good studies about about um, um, donating organs. So in a country, in Germany, for example, where it's up to the individual to make a choice to to donate organs, you you need to fill in a, a, a document in order to give away the, the, uh, your organs after you've died. Um, it is a big issue. Most people just don't want to fill out that certificate. Um, even though most people, there's nothing much about it, but, but it's only a small percentage of people doing so. In a country uh, like in Austria, where we have a donation by default, where the default is that your organs will be removed. It's not a big issue. Um, and, um, and hardly anyone is using the dropping out option. Uh, and no one sees anything, any worry associated to it. So here we see the altered circumstances um, um, uh, would turn, turn like the uh, donation by default, is, 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 it weakens the worries associated with it. And, and that would also, I, I assume, apply to to an obligatory chip and instead of having a passport. And, and, and then obviously data protection needs to be well, data primarily accessed by algorithms. And so this is, this is what I think has to be put in place in Europe if we actually cherish our well-being as well as, I mean, personal well-being as well as our economic flourishing. I think this will have to be the final question. James Hughes points out that GDPR enshrines the right to be forgotten. Uh, it also uh, enshrines the right for people to ask, well, why was this uh, decision made? Uh, you can't just say, well, the algorithm decided. Do you have any sympathy for either of these uh, parts of the GDPR or are there other uh, possible legal changes? And Natasha Vitamore is asking, what laws and regulations do you think ought to be brought in to provide protection for humans and transhumans owning their own bodies and minds? Oh, two very big questions still. Um, Sorry. <laughs> um, uh, right to be forgotten, starting first. Yeah, um, one can wonder, so why should one have this right to be forgotten? Of course, you might think, oh, what I did when I was 16, 17, 18, I put something on the internet, and that is, you know, that could be used against me later on when it gets into the hand of some people who want to use it against you. Um, but here, uh, one needs to be, you, you, you need to keep in mind um, what, I'm, what I've argued, what I've tried to stress earlier on, you know, we need a shift towards a much more pluralistic, a much more free and open society. So, so 
you don't have to fear the sanctions of what you did then. You don't have to, firstly, it needs, the data should be stored safely, not be accessed by humans. And thirdly, um, you don't have to fear any sanctions uh, about that because, because so, so sort of the, the rigid structures of what we still have in mind concerning values, you know, something, you know, we really need to get rid of. Sanctions it only sort of show around if direct harm, brutal harm is being done to another person. And this is sort of the difficult question, obviously, to make a decision when, when, when does this occur? And that's always a different question. But, um, but at least it shouldn't have to worry us that something needs to be forgotten, which one has done in the past, because, as I said, um, freedom needs to be promoted much further um, um, than this is the case right now. And Natasha stressed, what would it mean to own, own their body? When you own your bodies, that also means sort of when you died, basically the body becomes part of the inheritance. So um, in the same way as the hairs would, would, um, would, would, ha would inherit a, a building, a property, would inherit money, they would also inherit the body. And the body could then be used, maybe obligatory then, in order to, for, for, for research, for other purposes, for organ donation. So no, no, instead of organ donations, one could sell parts of the body and parts of the organs so that the inheritance would be increased. And there's some good reasons for turning sort of bodies into seeing as properties. But it, it's a really difficult question, actually. So, um, so I'm just, they, they have very good reasons in favor of moving into that direction. But it is, um, um, well, it's in the old days, yeah. in the old days, what I would say at this stage of a London Futurist meeting is that's such an interesting topic. Let's continue it in okay. the pub. We're not going to be able to discuss it in the pub. But what I will do, I will uh, send you a, a copy of the questions, Stefan. Uh, we Perfect. haven't made a very That's good job of covering them. We've covered the ones with the highest votes, but there are many other very good questions slightly further down the list. So you'll be able to look at them and uh, you don't need to answer them, but you might think about some of them at least. Yeah. I'll give you a moment to f offer final uh, comments shortly. What I would like to do myself, however, is briefly talk about the future of London Futurist. Today, we've had this uh, event. We have always been cyborgs. In a week's time, we are going to have Phil Torres, a distinguished existential risks researcher, who will be talking about his forthcoming book, Human Extinction, A History of Thinking About the End of the World, in which he will look at what people have said in the past. And he shares my view that we can actually become better at foresight by developing a better hindsight, that this historical understanding will give us a richer perspective on today's issues. Although some things will be different in the future from ever before, there is an element of, as Mark Twain said, rhyming from the past. And then after one more week, in two weeks' time from today, there is uh, something a bit different. We will have four panelists, two of whom, uh, Theo Priestley and Bronwyn Williams, are the co-editors and chapter writers of this new book, The Future Starts Now. And the two others who will be present, Kate O'Neill and Craig Wing, are some of the 20 authors of chapters in this book. And the goal of this book is to show uh, something that Stefan's been talking about, the value of diversity, that there is no simple one-track formula for the future. We need to be better at embracing a, a multiplicity of views about the future, including uh, bringing together many different disciplines. So that's what that book is trying to do. And we will have some highlights from that in a couple of weeks time. There will be more London Futurist events soon, which will be advertised in the usual places. Uh, Stefan, is there any final brief 60 second comments that you'd like to make that maybe people should bear in mind as they leave? For example, about your new book, when, when is it likely to be available? Uh, so many thanks, David, for that very kind uh, um, uh, invitation for having me here. And yes, it is. Um, so the, the, the book, which was firstly which was released end of last year in 2020 on Transhuman, which came out with Penn State University Press. That's sort of a primer to the subject. It's an introduction for the people, newcomers to the disciplines. Um, it's a rather short book and introductory. 
And then I've got the, we have always been cyborgs. This is where I address all these questions which we've been discussing today. Um, this will be out with Bristol University Press in, 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 in September, October, 2021. And, and there I develop all this idea in much more detail. I also develop a new uh, liberal ethics of fictive autonomy um, a liberal account, not a utilitarian account, which has been put forward by most transhumanists. So that might actually be, I hope, I mean, I've really, this is a collection, 100,000 words, monograph of mine, where I've put all these ideas in a, in a comprehensive manner in the book. So I'm, I'm already looking forward to the exchanges with all of you. And you know, many thanks also, you know, with Natasha, what well, wonderful question having been, I'm also looking forward to exchanging you know, to talking about all these forthcoming reflections with you and dear James. Yeah, wonderful that you also managed to join here and for asking all these extremely important questions. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to meeting all of you again and personally and, and with David and as well. And, um, and to then also hopefully again being, being able to go in the path and continue the discussion there in the future. So many, many thanks. Greetings from Rome, where we already got some wonderful sunshine and the blue sky. That's also something, at least, which makes life uh, living. Well, <laughs> look forward to meeting in Rome, look forward to meeting in London and elsewhere in the world as soon as possible. So I am sure these virtual meetings will continue as well. And that's part of being a slightly post-human. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll stop the recording now. Thank you.